right, good morning again, DCC. So good to see you guys at our 11:15 service. We still doing all right? Yeah. Ready to rock and roll in week three of Divided We Fall? That wasn't as confident, but we'll get there, okay? Look, so glad you guys are here. This is a series that's really challenging us to rise above the division that's present in our country right now. And it's a series that's helping us stay faithful and committed to our higher calling as followers of Jesus Christ. But before I jump into the message, okay, I want to celebrate something with you guys as your pastor. So what gets celebrated gets repeated. What gets repeated becomes a habit. So we need to celebrate something together. Yesterday on our campus, we hosted our first ever family dedication event. If that language is unfamiliar to you, that's how we do baby dedications here at DCC. And having it on a different day just allows us to be a little more intentional than we could doing that on a Sunday morning. And yesterday, guys, we had six families commit to raising their kids in a Christ-centered home. Can we celebrate that together? I think that's absolutely incredible. Here's what I believe. I believe that when the church partners together with the family, that we can make a greater impact together than either one of us could on our own. Don't you? And we're excited these families have made this commitment in that way. If you know those families, I'd encourage you to love on them. Let them know we're in their corner as their church family. And what I love about our church is our largest growth demographic right now are married couples with kids. And so if you didn't get to take part in this semester's dedication, just keep your eyes and ears open. We would love to have you be involved in the one that's going to happen in the spring. So, hey, help me out. As we dive into the message today, let me throw out a question, just kind of see where we're at. How many of you are familiar with the Berlin Wall? Let me see your hands. All right, good. We can work with this, okay? So the Berlin Wall is exactly what it sounds like, a wall that was built in the city of Berlin in 1961, and its purpose was to divide East Berlin from West Berlin. East Berlin identified more with a communist form of government, and Western Berlin identified with a more democratic form of government. What happened then is people from East Berlin were doing everything they could to go to West Berlin so they can enjoy a life and enjoy a freedom they felt like they needed. Now, I don't know last time you checked, but it ain't good for business if all your people are leaving your country, okay? So what East Berlin decided to do was build a 27-mile long wall to keep their people in and to keep people who wanted to come in out. To put that in perspective, um, it's like a mile shy of 27 miles from Prestonsburg to Pikeville, okay? So just imagine a 27-mile-long wall, 11-foot high, right smack dab in the middle of Highway 23 all the way to Pikeville, okay? If you're on the east, you're not getting over. If you're on the west, you're not getting over. That's what they were dealing with in that moment. This wall was more than a physical barrier, though. It really was a spiritual, a political, and an ideological barrier as well. And so when this wall was built, people were divided. Families were torn apart because of political differences. Countrymen were treated as enemies. Resentment was at an all-time high. And hope for people coming together to be united seemed at an all-time low. And if we're really honest today, That's exactly how we can feel sometimes in our political landscape, isn't it? Not in 1961, but today in 2024. So people are divided politically. Families are being torn apart politically. Countrymen are treated as enemies. Resentment is at an all-time high. And all hope for people coming together and uniting seems like it's at an all-time low. In our communities, in our lives, in our relationships, it just seems that walls are being built up and those walls are keeping us from understanding one another and those walls really are keeping us apart. And in a country, in a day and age that is more divided than ever, my challenge to you today is simple, okay? 
if we're going to thrive, not just survive, the next eight days in this election season, we have to be a people that champion unity and not be a people who champion division. Say that one more time. Maybe you can write that down or snap a picture of it. If we're going to thrive, not just survive, we have to champion unity and not division. How many of you have just noticed, okay, you know, if you watch TV or the news here lately, that it's more popular and easy to be divided than united right now? Let me see your hands. Okay. That's why attack ads are so rampant and they're more effective than positive ads. In fact, it's a proven fact that negativity will draw you more attention as a political candidate than positivity. So if you get a flyer in the mail this afternoon from a political candidate, and that flyer just talks about all the good they want to do, it's not going to be nearly as impactful as them sending you a flyer listing all the bad that their opponent does. So politicians will often, some of them, not all, play into this, and they will force you by nature to choose a side, pit you against one another, and be divided on what they call wedge issues. That's why things like social media algorithms are so detrimental to our lives today. True or false, social media is designed by nature to divide people. It is, absolutely. In fact, if you lean a certain way politically, the way the algorithms now work, is the only thing you're going to see, the only thing you're going to read, and the only thing you're going to hear about are issues that you already agree with. A question I will often get asked, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat or independent in the room today, is, Jacob, I, I just don't understand why people on the other side of the aisle don't see my perspective. Like, I don't get how they don't see what I'm seeing. And that's the entire point of social media. They're not going to see what you see. They're not going to read what you read. Because by nature, it is to divide people and champion division over unity. And certainly in our current political climate, okay, we hear more about what separates us than what unites us. We hear more about what divides us than unifies us. It's easier, it's more popular, and it's even encouraged to be divided right now. But as followers of Jesus, okay, and I hope every one of you in the room are today, I want us to choose a different path. I want to encourage you to be a champion for unity. I want to encourage you to focus more on what unites us as a people rather than what divides us. In fact, here's the big idea for today. Here's what will help move our lives in that direction. Guys, disagreement is unavoidable, but division is a choice. Do you know that? Like, disagreement is unavoidable. It's going to happen. But division is always a choice we make. Look, in, in a room like this, okay, and in a country like ours, we are bound to have disagreements, aren't we? Like, we were all raised a certain way. We all came from a certain family. We all hold a certain belief system. Disagreement is going to be unavoidable, even in a room like this. But division, listen to me, is a choice. Think about your marriage with me today and just how this works there. How many of you have ever gone uh, to get into the car with your wife and you asked them what you thought was a harmless question, okay? Hey, babe, where do you want to go? Harmless question, Right? Like just lobbing out the softball, putting the ball in your court to see what she's going to say. Does that ever go well? No, nah, because often what happens is um, they'll say, well, I don't care. Wherever you want to go, you come back with an option. And then they say, no, no not that. Okay. It's like, why would you even let me ask the question? Okay. Like disagreement is unavoidable. Like we're going to disagree, but division is a choice. No one is going to get divorced over choosing where or where not you're going to eat. And, and this is for free, by the way. I just love you and want to help your marriage, okay? If you want to avoid that altogether, next time you get into the car, just look at your spouse and ask this question instead. Say, hey, babe, guess where we're going? And the first thing they say, okay, you say, yep, that's exactly where we're going. You guessed right, and then you get brownie points because you 
are doing things right. Anyway, moving on from that very quickly. Think about your business, okay? Like disagreement is unavoidable in business. Uh, You may have differing opinions on what it looks like to achieve a project or deliverable that you have. You may have disagreement on how much money you want to allocate in your budget towards specific line items. You might have disagreements because you had to sit through another meeting that should have been an email, okay? Can I get an amen on that one? You're like, why the heck am I even here, okay? Disagreement is unavoidable, but listen, division is a choice. There's a lot of ways to skin the cat. There's a lot of ways to get things done. And the mission and vision of your organization, whatever that is, should be the driving force that unites you and helps you get those things done. Now think about our current political climate. Disagreement is unavoidable, but fear-mongering, demonizing people, canceling or criticizing people because they're on the other side of a political aisle is a choice. And today you have a choice in your life as a follower of Jesus. Are you going to champion unity and focus on what unites us? Or are you going to champion division and focus only on what divides us? Guys, when you look at Christianity, here's why this is so important. What unites us as Christians is always more important than what divides us. Amen? Because what unites us together is ultimately Jesus Christ, and he is more important than anything. Have you ever stopped and just thought about how amazing a gathering like this is in the local church? Like, look around you. There are people from all kinds of backgrounds, all kinds of families, all types of belief systems, and all types of political leanings. And what God has done is he's brought together all of these different people into one gathering that is the body of Christ. That's what Jesus Christ does. I can't think of any type of gathering in our community that would achieve what's right here in this room right now with all of these different types of people. What's happening in this room right now, because of Jesus, listen to me, is special And we should do everything we can to protect the unity that God would have us in. In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul, who is a follower of Jesus, is actually talking about this very thing. He's talking about the church in unity. And the church that he's writing to in the book of Ephesians is a very diverse church. They were made up of Jewish people and made up of Gentile people. Two different beliefs, two different lifestyles, two different families, two different political leanings, but God had brought them together as one unit that is the church, and he says they need to champion and protect unity amongst the body of Christ. Listen to what he says. He says, as a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life, let's say the words in yellow together, worthy of the calling you have received. So think back to week one of this series with me. What's our calling as followers of Jesus? It's to be citizens of heaven. It's to be an ambassador of Christ, to represent God's interests, not our interests. It's to be salt and light in a world that is dark and decaying and share Jesus and prioritize Jesus above all else. That's the calling we have received And Paul is imploring the church to walk in a way that is worthy of that calling. He says, be completely what? Humble and be bearing with one another in. Make half-hearted efforts. When it's convenient for you efforts. When it's what you believe efforts. Every effort to keep the what? The unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And then in verses 4 through 6, he gives us the reason why we should do this. You don't have to say yellow words on this one. Uh, There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called, to the one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. 
as followers of Jesus, listen, we are going to be different. But what matters is not how we are all different. What matters is how we are all the same. Paul says we have the same Lord. We have the same faith. We have the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, living in you and empowering you. We have the same Bible. We have the same salvation. We have the same home and place we're going to when this is all said and done, which is heaven. We should champion unity and not division because we are similar and the same in that way. And in verses 2 through 3, Paul gets very practical with us on how we can move our lives from championing, championing division to championing unity. I'll throw these out here for you. Hopefully they are helpful for you. Paul talks in verse 2 about the importance of being humble instead of prideful. That will help you champion unity in your life and build bridges instead of burning bridges. I told the men this a couple of weeks ago at Momentum on Monday night. I said, hey, when you think about pride in your life, pride really boils down to one word, and that word is better. And so some people are walking around today and they have this mentality that says, hey, I deserve better. You know anybody like that? So if we walk around thinking everyone owes me something, if we walk around thinking we're always entitled to something, if we walk around thinking we deserve something because we're the greatest thing on earth since sliced bread, okay, it's going to cause problem and tension in your relationships. True or false? True. True. Some of us aren't walking around thinking I deserve better. Some of us are walking around thinking, hey, I know better. How many of your teenagers think they know better than you and what you're asking them to do? That's what I thought. So, hey, I'm always right. Everyone else is always wrong, especially when it comes to politics. Any Parks and Rec fans in the room today? Anybody remember that scene with Ron Swanson where he walks into Lowe's to get some supplies, and the worker says, hey, how can I help you today? He says, I know more than you do, and just (laughs) keeps walking, okay? I know better, right? It's a prideful mentality, and true or false, that can cause disunity and division in your relationships. Some of us aren't walking around saying I deserve better or know better. Some of us have a mentality that says I am better. Maybe it's because of the way that you look, Maybe it's because of the letters after your name. Maybe it's because of the size of your bank account. Maybe it's because of the car that you drive. Maybe it's because of the family that you come from. But for some reason, you find yourself believing and acting like I am better than everyone around us. When you look at Jesus, though, who's our example and who we want to be like, he was different. He didn't walk around with this mentality that said, hey, I'm better than everyone around me. He lived his life in a way that said, I want to make everyone else better around me. Jesus made a conscious decision in his life to exalt other people instead of exalting himself. He chose to serve other people instead of serving himself. He chose to trust God in his life instead of only trusting himself in his life. And Jesus always made efforts to make other people better instead of making himself better. He was a humble person. And if we will model that and move our lives in that direction, we will build more bridges and build more unity instead of division. Paul talks about being humble instead of prideful, but in the same verse of Ephesians chapter 4, he says that we should be gentle instead of harsh. One of my favorite verses in Proverbs is Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1. I feel like I say that every time I quote Proverbs. They're all my favorite. It's all great. You should read it sometime. (laughs) He says, a gentle answer, what's he say? Turns away wrath, but harsh words, what? Stirs up anger. How many of you have had someone just just come at you in anger before? And like they were at level 10 and you decided, all right, big boy, I'm going to meet you right back at level 10. Yeah. What'd that do? 
stirred up a whole bunch of anger. Listen, how many of you have had someone come to you in anger and at level 10, and you responded with a gentle answer? Oh, hey, you know what? You're right. I did say that word that was hurtful. I did do something that offended you. I'm wrong. You're right. Thank you for pointing that out and helping me get better. It turns away wrath. If we will model and do the same thing in our lives as followers of Jesus, especially in an election season, I'm telling you, we will champion unity instead of division. What if, like I I know this is crazy, okay, but what if the next time someone did evil to you, you responded by doing good to them? What if the next time someone land blasted you on social media, you didn't say a thing and you just let your character and integrity defend itself? What if the next time someone wanted to stir up a political argument, you took the high road, you beelined to Jesus, and you made the whole entire conversation about him? Your life, your family, your relationships would move in a direction of unity. Paul talks about the importance of being patient instead of impatient. I hate that he put that there because that one's a struggle for me, okay? Proverbs chapter 14, verse 29, listen to this. Whoever is what? Is better than the mighty. And he who rules his spirit. So you're controlling your emotions more than they're controlling you. He who rules his spirit is greater than he who takes a city. How many of you would say that you have a short fuse when it comes to anger? You see your hands? How many of you would say you have a long fuse when it comes to anger? As a follower of Jesus, you have to pre-decide what you're going to do when angry moments come in your life. Are you going to have a short fuse and fly off the handle at the smallest of things or arguments? Or are you going to Have a long fuse because that's what God does for you. Are you going to be patient with people because you know how patient God has been with you? Are you going to be slow to anger because you know how slow to anger God has been with you? Are you going to be quick to forgive because you know how quick God is to forgive you? I'm telling you, if we will do this, our lives will move in a direction where you're not building walls and burning bridges. You will move from a place where you are building bridges and championing unity in people's lives. The last thing Paul lists and that I'll share with you is he talks about the importance of loving versus hating. So we'll get more into this next week. Next week focuses entirely on loving instead of hating. But I want to give you this. Jesus gave a phrase to his disciples in John chapter 13, verse 35. You may be familiar with it. Help me out. Jesus said, by this, everyone will know you are my disciples by your your vote, your political candidate, your love. As the world looks at you, And the unconditional love you have for people. That points towards the greater love that God has for you. And the ultimate display of love this entire world has ever seen. Which is the love of Jesus Christ. Because what you're doing is you are choosing love over hate. And you are championing unity instead of division. And here's what I want you to see. As you champion unity, as you focus on what unites us instead of what divides us, as you choose to be humble instead of prideful, gentle instead of harsh, 
patient instead of impatient, and loving versus hating, something amazing happens. One by one, you begin to tear down the walls that have been built up in the lives of people around you, and you begin to build bridges and create unity in the life of people around you. In 1989, at the end of the Cold War, the German government ordered that wall to be destroyed. They realized that dividing the people was not achieving the result they wanted, and so they tore down the wall and focused on uniting and bringing the people together. And what happened is it changed everything. Friends and family were reunited. Things that once divided them no longer mattered. There was no longer division in people's lives, but there was healing and unity that took place in people's lives. And don't miss this. In a similar way, the Bible would describe a very similar situation in our lives as followers of Jesus. See, the Bible would put all of us in the same boat and predicament. It would say we're sinners. We all, myself included, have done things we know we shouldn't do. And we haven't done things we know we should do. This is what the Bible calls sin. And because we have sinned against a holy God, Ephesians chapter 2 says a dividing wall of hostility is set up between us and God. But the good news of the Bible and the good news of Christianity is that 2,000 years ago, God sent his son, Jesus Christ. Amen? And Jesus lived a perfect life that you and I could never live. And Jesus died a horrific death on the cross that you and I deserve to die. And the Bible says that when Jesus died on the cross... He broke down the dividing wall of hostility that was between man and God. And he has made peace and forgiveness and love and healing and a relationship with God possible because of what he did for us when he was here on this earth. And it changed everything. People, regardless of who they are or where they've been, regardless of background or experiences, can be forgiven and loved and accepted into God's family. And I don't know about you, that's the message people need to hear more than anything over the next eight days. That is what will unite our country instead of dividing our country. That is what will bring people together from all walks of life instead of tearing people down. That's what will change the human heart. That's what will solve the problem of brokenness in our world. And that message, the message of King Jesus, is what will give people answers to the questions they have. As followers of Jesus, God has given you a higher calling. He has called you to champion unity and not division. And as we look ahead to the next week and over the next eight days, let's be a people who share that message. Let's be a people that share Jesus and make him the priority. Let's be a people that point others to him in words and action to be humble, gentle, patient, and loving. And I guarantee you that's going to change things in your life. And that's going to change things in other people's life. Because that does not just change people's lives for four years. That changes people's lives for all of eternity. Let's champion unity and not division. And let me pray that God would help us with that. Father, we come before you. And God, I I just confess to you that I can't do this on my own. I can't champion unity over division on my own. I need your strength. I need your help. I need your power. And God, I know if I feel that way, 
that there's probably someone else in the room today who feels that way as well. And so, Father, I pray that you would help us to be gentle people. Help us to be patient people. God, patience is a fruit of the Spirit. You have to produce that in us. We don't have it ourselves. God, please produce that in our hearts and produce that in our lives. God, help us to be a people who are humble instead of prideful. And help us to be a people that show the love of Jesus Christ instead of showing hate and showing division. God, we know that unity does not mean uniformity. We know that disagreement is inevitable. But division is a choice. Help us to make the right choice this week and in our lives so that bridges can be built and unity can be fostered. God, transform us by this word today. Don't just inform us by it so we can be more like Jesus and share Jesus with the people around us. And I ask these things in Jesus' good name. Amen.